So I want to uh, thank everybody for coming and joining us tonight. I will probably put you on mute while Kevin is talking. We'll be able to, at the end, open it up to discussions, which would be great. If you have any questions throughout, the chat box will be open. Please feel free to type them in and I will make sure I'm monitoring those. And I know that they pop up on Kevin's end as well. So right now I, I'll turn this over to Kevin, uh, Dr. Kevin Kessler, sorry. And uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ashley, thank you so much. And I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, before we start, I know there are several of you who um, are tuning in from far fun places across the United States. And the first thing I wanna do is mention that the Brookings Arts Council is, is hosting these. Ashley is, is uh, the head of the Brookings Arts Council and she's been in this job um, maybe a little over a year now, and she's just absolutely revolutionized the Arts Council in Brookings. They are just doing fabulous things, and they are being recognized for those marvelous uh, programming that they've been doing. Uh, they were recently named, uh, or they were recently awarded the Governor's Award in the Arts for the state of South Dakota, which is a really prestigious award, and today, uh, the city of Brookings proclaimed it Brookings Arts Council um, Day in the city of Brookings and could just as well be Ashley Regsdale Day because of all the fantastic work she has done. So congratulations to Ashley and the Brookings Area Arts, Arts Council. I, I have to tell you with the things that are going on in the School of Performing Arts at SDSU and at the Brookings Arts Council in, in the community, we are fast becoming the envy of the arts community in the state of South Dakota, with, without a doubt. Um, so this, this little history project uh, came about when I was uh, getting my doctorate at the University of Iowa. Uh, about my second year there, my advisor, uh, Dr., Dr. Mark Heidel said, uh, what you have to start thinking about a dissertation. You know, what are you going to do? And at, at that time, I really had no idea. Uh, and so we started throwing about uh, ideas and subjects. And he said, he said, well, what do you, what do you like? What do you like to write about? And I said, well, I really like history. I, I like reading about history. I enjoy, uh, you know, that type of research. And he knew that I was a graduate of South Dakota State. And he said, you know, your band, your marching band has done a lot of things. Uh, and he was familiar with the, you know, some of the larger events that the band had done, the, the inaugural parades, the world parades, et cetera. He said, uh, have you considered writing a history of the SDSU band? And this came up because there had just recently been two histories written of the Iowa bands, one about the marching band and the other about the concert band at the University of Iowa, which, um, Incidentally, the history of the concert band at the University of Iowa was written by a gentleman by the name of Larry Peterson, who is an SDSU grad, and he got his doctorate at Iowa as well. So that's where this all comes from. So this is kind of a condensed uh, and, and maybe more entertaining uh, travel through the SDSU band history, as opposed to maybe somewhat of a, a dry, uh, dry read that is a dissertation. Tried to make it as entertaining as I could, but you know, it's it's an academic document. So I'm going to hit screen share here, and I've got some slides with some really great pictures, and I'm just going to share some stories uh, about the history of this band that we love so much. Um, First of all, let's get to the slideshow here. There we go. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, to understand the, the origins of the band, we have to first understand the, the beginnings of the college. In 1881, uh, a gentleman by the name of James O'Brien Scobie got a seat in the territorial legislature. At that time, of course, South Dakota was not a state. We were still attached to North Dakota. Uh, and so the legislature met in Yankton at the ter territorial cap capital. And Scobie went with the idea that, um, Scobie went with the idea that he was going to get the prison for Brookings. He wanted the territorial prison to be in Brookings. And he also went uh, to get his law partner a job as the chair of public instruction, which would probably be, you know, today's equivalent to the head of um, 
the Department of Education. When he got to Yankton, he was told that the jail was going to Sioux Falls and that the job of the head of public instruction was already taken. And so the story goes that Scobie settled for the Ag College. And it just kind of shows you the precariousness of higher education uh, out, out here in the early 1880s. Uh, not a lot settled at that time, uh, but the population was growing and they saw the need for an agri agricultural college and it was there for the taking. So Scobie settled on it. And that was 1881. And classes didn't even start until 1884. It became the land grant college in 1889 when South Dakota and North Dakota became states. Land grant college, uh, the idea behind a land grant college is that the United States government gave the state of South Dakota um, several thousand acres of government owned land and they were allowed to do whatever they wanted with it, sell it, and those proceeds would go to fund the school. And the school was uh, mostly supposed to be uh, for agriculture and mechanic arts, like engineering and so forth. And that's what it became. It was Dakota Agricultural College and then it was South Dakota Agricultural College. It was renamed South Dakota State College in 1907 and finally South Dakota State University in 1964. So music was part of SDSU or Dakota Agricultural College at the time, right away. Um, as I said, classes started in 1884 and the newspaper, which is now known as the Collegian at that time, known as the College Sheaves, started in January uh, of, that, of that first academic year. And in the very first issue of the college newspaper, they mentioned music. And at that time it was vocal music. And there was a professor by the name of Parker we really don't know much about O.H. Parker. We don't even know what their first name was, but they apparently did efficient work teaching vocal music there. Um, and they also, from what we understand, worked without pay. So finally, the university in the spring of 1885 hired a music instructor by the name of Stephen Latham. And this is Latham here, picture as you can see in the screen. Uh, he came to South Dakota from New York. He had been born and raised in New York, and he was a Civil War musician. He served as a musician first class in the 28th New York Regiment uh, for one year at the very beginning of the war from 1861 until 1862. So not long after he got there, there was evidence of instrumental activities at, at the college. Um, they talked about um, there being a drum corps and not exactly sure what, if it was just drums or what we think of as a drum corps as brass and drums, but there's, there's just faint um, mentions of it in the school newspaper. So uh, the band eventually started to get a foothold. And, but of course with college students, the, the more things change, the more things stay the same. And the newspaper at that time, um, pulled no punches in their assessment of performances on the college campus. As you see here, instrumental music by Miss Carrie Ross would have been very sweet had it received more study. <laughs> so apparently Carrie didn't practice enough for whatever instrumental performance she was doing and, and that has been lost to time uh, as far as what she played. But uh, I, I just, when I found that, I just thought that was very funny that uh, some, things, some things never change. Sometimes we practice and sometimes we don't. So again, instrumental music, band music at SDSU at, at that time, again, Dakota Agricultural College was kind of in fits and starts. It would come and go. And we could tell by the newspaper reports that it, it wasn't um, a going concern and then sometimes it would be. For instance, you see in May, the spring of the first year of classes, it says we have a drum corps at college. Uh, and then just about a year later, it says that there's a rumor that a college band is to be organized. So somewhere along, somewhere along the line, it, it disappeared. And then somewhat of a snarky uh, remark here in, in October of 1886, so what would have been the third year of classes, the college band will contain 12 pieces when fully organized 
they will make more noise than now, maybe, but we doubt it. So it apparently uh, the band had come and gone. And there's evidence of that in some of the writings of the students. And also um, in the course catalog, this is a course catalog from 1886, the third year of classes. And this catalog was uh, a course listing, a faculty listing, kind of an advertisement for the college. And as you see here, uh, they list musicians and what they played. Professor Latham is, is listed. There's a trumpeter and other members of the band. Drummers are listed as well. So there was some kind of music there. Um, and what exactly it is, we have a little bit of evidence of what that band did. Mostly they played for um, military functions. As the land grant college, there was a Corps of Cadets, a forerunner to ROTC as we know it today. And at that time, it was compulsory of the male students on campus to be part of this Corps of Cadets. And they did training on the campus green and there was uh, band music to accompany it. As I said, one of the, there are some contemporaries contemporaneous um, accounts of band music happening at SDSU as early as 1886. John Merton Aldrich was one of the first graduates. He was in the first graduating class at Dakota Agricultural College, and he kept a very detailed diary, which is um, at SDSU, it's in the archives, the original. And he writes about the band playing in November of 1886. The band also played when the new president, Louis McClough, uh, came to SDSU in December of 1886. And he even talks a little bit about it in McClough's diary that the college band uh, met McClough at the train station and played a, a few more times downtown. And this is December of 1886. However, um, as much as McClough probably appreciated the band welcoming him to Brookings, McClough was very strict to the land grant mission. And because he was, he cut back a bunch of liberal arts uh, programs, one of which being music. And so the band disappeared uh, in 1886. And from there, there is no uh, evidence of band happening between 1887 and 1890. And any of the, uh, any of the musical needs that were on campus, um, if they needed a band for the Corps of Cadets, there was a community band in Brookings that handled those, those duties. But eventually in 1890, um, the Board of Trustees at the Dakota Agricultural College decided it was time to have a band. And this may be hard for you to read, so I'm just going to read this. This is from the minutes, the meeting minutes of the Board of Trustees for, the, for South Dakota Agricultural College. Um, by vote passed the following resolution, resolved that it meets with the approval of the board that a military band be organized at college for college benefits and that the board will cheerfully furnish instruments if funds can be made available during the next year and that Professor Latham be authorized to organize a band immediately without cost to the college. So they were all for a band, uh, but they weren't gonna pay for it. Uh, <laughs> so. We have uh, a lot of evidence that uh, students, as far as uniforms, they wore their Corps cadet uniforms, and that's evidenced by a lot of old pictures, some of which will show that you can tell some of the, some of the uh, cadets had a higher rank than others, so their uniforms look different, different. A lot of the students owned their own instruments. But um, other fundraising, uh, as, far as, as far as keeping the band uh, afloat financially, uh, lessons were given on voice, violin, um, percussion, and wind instruments, and those lesson fees supported the function of the band. Eventually, they asked the board of trustees that ran the college itself for $1,000. Uh, that was rejected, but eventually the board of regents, who ran all of the colleges in South Dakota, gave $300 to support the band. And then it was listed as the first regiment band. So it really had a military, um, had a military background. And that was its basic function at that point was to provide music for military function. There was a uh, kind of a political upheaval at the university in 1892 and about half of the faculty was fired. And amongst them was Latham. 
as well as his wife, who was teaching vocal music at the time. Um, they were fired. Uh, no reason necessarily why they were just on the wrong side of the argument and they were let go. Um, as far as we know, they, they returned from what I understand, they returned back to New York and lived their life out there. So then uh, the band was kind of handed over to several people for the next few years. And this lovely picture here is from 1892. And it's the oldest photo that I can find of the band. You see on the left-hand side here, uh, are the band members kind of hard to see. I don't know if I can, I can't really pull it much bigger, but on the left-hand side here is the, is the band. On the right-hand side is, is the Corps of Cadets. And again, that's from 1892. It's about the oldest photo I've been able to find of the band. So when Latham left, the, the director, direction of the band was turned over to uh, a gentleman by the name of Gilbert Young, who taught woodworks and taught ironworks. And he left for a short time to get advanced training at Purdue and a gentleman by the name of Harry Cornell directed the band for a short time. And then Young came back and ran the band for a, about five years. There's, um, I put George Young, but his name was Gilbert Young, apologize. But there's Gilbert Young, handsome young man and he not only taught woodwork and metalwork, but he directed the band for five years during uh, that time. And that's when the band really started to gain a foothold and since 1890 has been in continuous service. Young took the band to some really kind of fascinating performances. Um, the state colleges had a athletic conference and every year they had what was called a state meet. And at that time, the main event was track. Football was really not uh, a popular sport yet, but so track and field, they had bicycle races, they had boxing matches, and they had band competitions. And so he would take the band uh, to these uh, state intercollegiate athletic meets and the band would play there. Um, and they did that in 1896 and they did that in 1897. We'll talk about that in a moment. But one of the more fascinating uh, trips they took was in 1896, they went to Minneapolis, Minnesota, and they played for something called a GAR encampment. GAR was the Grand Army of the Republic. And these encampments were um, reunions for Civil War soldiers. And they had these once a year in different cities all over the country. And in 1896, it just happened to be in Minneapolis, and the State College Band went and performed for that encampment. So really kind of their first big trip. And if you consider travel in 1896, going from Brookings to Minneapolis was probably a, a, a pretty tough trip to make. So that, that was a big deal. In 1897, as I said, they went to this state track meet and band contest again. And as you can see um, in the history of the, uh, of the college, they write a little bit about this particular meet and that they really didn't have very good athletes. Um, they really didn't have good speakers for the oratorical, oratorical contest, but the band took first place in the band competition at the state meet. So I think we've, we can say we've been undefeated since 1897. And there's that band. That is a, a photo from 1897. It's just a beautiful picture. So as I said, Young ran the band for about five years. And then uh, I don't know if he left the university, but the leadership was turned over uh, to a gentleman named Harley Hayes Husted. And he had played clarinet. He taught mathematics. Uh, eventually the band bug kind of bit him because he left SDSU and went to the University of Nebraska and got an advanced degree in music and became a band director in Nebraska. Um, unfortunately, his, his life was cut short. He contracted tuberculosis in Nebraska, but he, he went on to become um, a trained musician and a band director. After he left, uh, another former member by the name of Orr took the band over uh, in 1900 and he directed the band for one year. 
This picture is really, uh, it's not your screen. It's, it's not a very high quality picture. But right here in the center of the back row of the mandolin orchestra, if you've ever heard of a mandolin orchestra, but right here is Husted in the middle of the back row. And then over here on the far left with the cello is Orr. Uh, so not only were they in the band, but they were in the mandolin orchestra too. I find these old pictures are just really, uh, really fascinating. So we talked a little bit about the band playing for sports. And it's interesting to note that the first football game at SDSU was in 1889. And then they didn't play again for about eight years. And they started playing football again in 1897. But I really couldn't find any evidence of the band playing there. I would like to think they probably did because they played for a lot of events like that. But I couldn't find any evidence of the band playing for a football game until about 1904. Uh, and strangely enough, that was an away game. They traveled to Vermilion to play for the South Dakota Agricultural College playing the U down in Vermilion. And that was the first I could see that the band had played for a game. There's a, a better picture of Professor Orr. He would also go on to become the registrar at the college. And he also taught commercial science in addition to being a musician. So now we kind of move into a, a little more of a modern era in the bands. Uh, uh, John Parmalee Mann was hired in, in 1901 to teach vocal music, band, and stringed instruments. And he was the first um, teacher hired by the college specifically to teach, uh, to teach band uh, after, after Latham. So uh, he was from Ohio, and as you can tell, he was a very young man when he came to SDSU, about 25 or 26 years old. Um, and he led the band for just a couple of years, but one of the major events that he took them to was kind of the first um, international event that the band played for. And that was the World's Fair in 1904, uh, which was in St. Louis. So there's a picture of the band. I'm not sure if that's the exact uh, band that went to St. Louis, but uh, it's from that year. About this time, uh, music became a four-year course at the college for the first time. And that's part of the reason that Mann was hired, because he coordinated that program. And music was, and the band was now listed under the de uh, Department of Music and Physical Culture instead of being aligned directly with, with, the, uh, with the military. So the trip to St. Louis um, was uh, about 12 days uh, and travel again had to be very difficult. By 1904, there was only one car in town and that was being driven by Professor Solberg who uh, started the engineering department at SDSU. So you can imagine, uh, probably had to take a uh, horse and carriage to a train and maybe multiple changing of lines and so forth. So getting to, to St. Louis was probably pretty pretty big chore. But they were able to stay in St. Louis for free and they were put up in barracks in exchange for doing daily drills and as, as a display. The trip cost everybody $25 a man uh, and that included the train and the meals and so pretty good deal uh, for 25 bucks. And, and the story goes is that when they got back they were refunded $2.15 because it didn't cost them 25 bucks to go, so they got a little money back. So uh, the press in St. Louis immediately uh, were enamored with the cadet corps and the band from South Dakota State College. And I have to read you this because just the, the prose that they use to describe uh, these, these band, band members and cadet corps members is, is really, <laughs> quaint. 125 cadets of the South Dakota Agricultural College of Brookings, South Dakota trudged manfully through the thick mud and stepped unheedingly into pools of water that were plentiful in the administration quadrangle yesterday afternoon while they gave a dress parade. The cadets arrived Saturday evening with a band of 35 pieces they are an especially husky lot of cadet soldiers and have the deep tan of the Dakota wheat fields on their cheeks and hands. 
The entire company of officers and cadets have come to the fair at their own expense and in their wake have come many admiring South Dakotans. So they had a reception and a dance for them. And this was from uh, the St. Louis Republic newspaper. I, I just, like I said, love some of the descriptions of, of that group that, that went to St. Louis. There was their, uh, their performance schedule. They performed five times during the course of their stay. And then on the next page here, I think it's the next page, uh, there's just a, a lovely picture of the band and the Corps of Cadets. There it is. Isn't that wonderful? The band's there in the back. And then uh, two groups, I don't know if we refer to them as squads or company, maybe companies, two companies of, of cadets uh, side by side there in St. Louis. Funny story about their trip home. Uh, on their trip home, they had to stop in Mankato to switch trains and they were also allowed time, uh, time in the city to go find something to eat. But on their way home, they could not find one seat in a restaurant anywhere because the Barnum and Bailey Circus was in town and everybody had come to Mankato to watch the circus and they could not find a place to eat <laughs> when they went through Mankato. Uh, some, some wonderfully descriptive uh, newspaper articles uh, told the story of this trip. And some of those are, are just great. So when Mann left, um, a new band director and vocal instructor was hired. His name was Francis Haynes. He was from Michigan. He had taught at a couple colleges in uh, Ohio and Michigan before coming to State College in 1906. What's important about Haynes, and there's a picture of Haynes there in the center with the band. During his time, the band got a little smaller. They dropped maybe on average 10 members. And at that time when the band was only 35, 10 is a fairly significant number, but they were still very good um, from all accounts. And the one thing that we have Haynes to thank for is one of our school songs. In 1907, I hope I have the right year there. I believe that's right. In 1907, Haynes advertised in the school newspaper a contest to write a school song. Nobody took him up on it. And so he was left to write the school song by himself. Well, luckily he had a friend and his friend name was Niels Hansen. Hansen was the head of the horticulture department at SDS, or SDAC but not only was he a horticulturist and known worldwide for um, his trips to Russia in which he brought back uh, alfalfa and fruit trees and things that grew in Siberia because he figured if they could grow in Siberia, they could grow in South Dakota because pretty similar climate, <laughs> especially today. Uh, Hansen was very famous for that and uh, of course, before we get back, before we get to the tune, uh, a little more about Hanson. If for all of you who come back to Hobo Day and, and wear a mum and you buy a mum, that was Hanson's work. Um, in the early Hobo Days, Hanson put on a huge floral show. And the mum is kind of a, a remnant of that floral, floral show that Hanson used to put on during Hobo Day. So, um, but Hansen was a was an amateur poet. And so he and Haynes got together and they wrote The Yellow and Blue, which is now, of course, our alma mater. And there was the refrain to The Yellow and Blue. Now, like I said, in 1964, we became a university, which made the song even better because now it rhymed. Before it was OSDSC, hurrah for the yellow and blue. Now it's SDSU, hurrah for the yellow and blue, like it was meant to be.
If that sounds like an old recording, it is. It's a recording of uh, Carl Christensen's band from 1952, and we're just about to meet Carl Christensen. So I thought that was a good segue to hear. Carl Christensen came to, actually came to the college in 1906. He was hired the same year as Haynes, but he was hired to teach stringed instruments and cornet. Um, he did not take over the band until Haynes left in 1911. Christensen's story is a pretty interesting one. He immigrated from Denmark. His family was very musical. His father ran an opera house in Copenhagen and his mother would oversee his uh, violin practices, which he started at the age of six. Christensen told the story of how he would practice and his mother would have a small table with matchsticks laid out in a row. And every time he played an exercise correctly, she would pick, pick the matchstick up from the table and put it away. But if he didn't play it to her satisfaction, the matchstick stayed on the table. And uh, he described that that was kind of a, a rough way to practice for a young boy. Uh, they came overseas and in 1893 and they lived in Tyler, Minnesota, not very far from here in Brookings, just in the Marshall area. Um, he played trombone, he played cornet, cornet and he taught himself uh, clarinet as well. He lived in the Quad Cities area for a few years around the turn of the century, took some lessons, played in a semi-professional band there. There is some evidence that Christensen moved to Brookings before 1906 and was giving some, some private lessons um, in, the, in the community before he joined the faculty. But he came, became band director in 1911 um, was department head in 1918 and served in that capacity until the 1950s. He never had a uh, earned college degree. He received a, an honorary degree from the McPhail, McPhail School of Music, which used to be in the in the Twin Cities, where he did some uh, did some studying there. Never received a degree, but did some studying while he taught um, at the college. He was elected to the very prestigious American Bandmasters Association in 1932. That is an organization that is still around today and it is um, an ex exclusive, exclusive club of only the very best uh, band directors in the world. He started the South Dakota Bandmasters Convention, which is still going today. He was a founding member of the Bandmasters Association here in South Dakota. And he was in the first class of inductees to the South Dakota Bandmasters Hall of Fame. There's a picture of his first band in 1911. Christie can be seen right here in the far left, about the third guy over, he's holding a cornet. And that's in front of Solberg Hall, the engineering hall, which still stands today. And you can see the differences in some of the uniforms that we had talked about. Christie was a revolutionary figure in, in the band history at SDSU. The band grew to over 100 members during his time. They made several state and regional tours. Um, at that time, it was called the Military Band, and so it was a male-only uh, band, but he started a girls band on campus, and that band uh, operated on and off for a little over 20 years during the 20s and 30s. Um, he guided the band through many budget prop crises, including the Great Depression, uh, when not only there was you know, a huge economic depression, but they also cut the music program. The music major was cut during the 1930s. And so he had to deal with that. Um, he was a revolutionary character in regard to um, making the band co-ed. During the war, during the Second World War, of course, the male population at the university dropped drastically because they were they were off to war. And so he made the band co-ed to keep the numbers up. For a short time after the war, it went back to all male. But then in the late 40s, the band became co-ed again. And to give you some perspective of how progressive that was, there were a lot um, of major college marching bands that were not co-ed until Title IX came into being in the 70s. And when I mean major college bands, for instance, every, every band in the Big Ten Conference, 
every marching band in the Big Ten Conference did not become co-ed until the early 70s. And Christie was 25 years ahead of the curve on that. I think that's a really special thing about our band history. He was a busy man. He taught marching band, the concert band, the orchestra, and was department head. There's a picture of the girls band from the 19, uh, 19, 19, 19, 20 girls band. As the band grew, he was also turning a lot, turning out a lot of music education majors. And so it became this kind of self-feeding uh, program in that he would create a lot of good band directors. They'd go on to the South Dakota and Minnesota and Iowa. They would build up programs and those kids would turn around and come back to South Dakota State. So by 1939, he had 140 members in the band and the enrollment at the college was just right around a thousand. So that's amazing. 14% of the college enrollment was in the band. It's just absolutely unheard of. This is a little bit of a tough picture to see, but it's the band in the 1913 Hobo Day Parade, the second Hobo Day Parade that I was able to dig up. It's an interesting story about how Christy took the bands through the parade. Um, he didn't do this every year he was there, uh, but early on, in the early Hobo Day parades, instead of taking the whole band down the street in their uniforms, he split the band into smaller groups and had them dress like hobos. And so instead of one college band going up the street in uniform, there were maybe five or six little bands that were dressed as hobos marching up the street. Now, there's photographic evidence that eventually he stopped doing that and took the whole band up the street in uniform, but I always thought that was a fun story, how the band got into the spirit of, of Hobo Day and dressed up dressed up like hobos to go, to go up the street. The band for one year was the official band of the South Dakota National Guard. In the early part of last century, the, the Guard did not have their own band like they do now. Now they have the 147th that is stationed in Mitchell. But they would uh, muster in community bands to handle musical duties for um, for the South Dakota National Guard. And for a long time, the Watertown Community Band served that purpose. Well, they started having some arguments with the Watertown Community Band. And, and finally, uh, the last straw came when um, the South Dakota National Guard was about to do their summer encampment and they called the Watertown Band and they said, we need you here on this state. And the Watertown Band said, nope, we've raised money to go to California and we're going to California. So uh, the Watertown Band was basically fired and in 1915, the entire South Dakota Agricultural Band, uh, Agricultural College Band, became the official band of the South Dakota National Guard. And here's Christy in the middle, in uniform, playing his cornet with the rest of the SDAC band at the National Guard encampment, about 1915. Luckily, they were mustered out in 1916, and not long after that, the band that replaced them uh, were sent to the Texas border to guard the border at the beginning of the First World War. And a lot of those band members eventually uh, went overseas. Here's a picture of the band from the 50s, early 50s. You see Christy at the bottom, always, always carried his coronet, occasionally would play along. Uh, if you're if, if you're from this era or from around there, you can see in the upper right-hand corner that this building here on the corner was the J.C. Penney's. And I have a feeling is this is a, it looks like a filling station, but it also looks like the building that maybe uh, Nix is in now. I'll leave that up there for a moment. I know there's lots of people taking a close look at that picture. It's a great angle. So in the early days of marching band, it was just that. There was very, it was parade. There wasn't a lot of uh, field drill or formations being done. But 
there are, um, as a matter of fact, there's, there's some newspaper accounts of the halftime show was little more than the band getting on the field and marching up and down the field. And some of the fans would get in behind the band and basically just march with the band up and down the field in a big parade. And that was the halftime show. But by 1914, uh, bands across the country were starting to make formations or just do letters. And the first documentation of that happening at Brookings was in October of 1914 when they formed an S at halftime. And you can see here this picture, um, I believe from I believe from the 30s. I don't have an exact date on this, but I believe from the 30s, they're spelling out N D U to welcome North Dakota University to campus for the game. This is at State Field, and I know some of you remember State Field. You're looking north. Um, this this photo would have been taken from the south stands, uh, facing north, and the band sat in that empty area there. And just a few pictures of some of the things they did. You see here, they're kind of on a counter march. They're, they're marching toward one another. And another photo here. It's kind of hard to tell what they're doing. It looks like they're kind of marching in some spirals and, and the rest of these files are about ready to march onto the field. So this was very the very uh, infancy of drill writing uh, at SDSU, and I'll talk about that a little more in just a moment. I think if you were to ask Christy, the highlight of his career came in 1939. He received a letter from the Winnipeg Royal Welcome Week Committee, and he was told that King George VI and Queen Consort Elizabeth were coming to North America, and it was the first time that sitting British monarchs had ever come to North America. Uh, king George VI was uh, the stuttering king. If you are familiar with the story of the king's speech, uh, he was the king that took over for his brother when his brother advocated, uh, ab abdicated the throne uh, to marry uh, Wallace Simpson. So he, he was a very popular, became a very popular king, but he was quite new in 1939. And so, they went on a world tour. They started in, in um, Washington, D.C. and actually spent some time with the Roosevelts at the White House and then made their way across Canada. So it's, it's just a wonderful story. Christie had to raise $1,000 to get the band up to Winnipeg. He had to do it in a very short amount of time. And as, as is true of the history of this band, they were uh, supported and embraced by all kinds of individuals and organizations, and they quickly raised the $1,000. They got money from a dance. They got money from other campus organizations. They did something called a tag day, and tag day was nothing more than um, you, uh, you gave a, an amount of money and you were given back a tag that you could pin to your shirt that said, I gave to the band. Uh, and so they had a tag day and they raised $1,000 and they took 100 band members up to Winnipeg. They left on a Tuesday, March 24th. They left at 4 a.m. and they got to Winnipeg at 5 p.m. So there was a 13 hour bus ride. Uh, and of course, no interstates at that time. Uh, it's not nearly a 13 hour drive to Winnipeg anymore from here. So it was quite a drive and apparently uh, for entertainment on one of the buses, the assistant director, a guy by the name of Edward Schrepfer, played clarinet as the bus rolled along from Brookings to uh, Brookings to Winnipeg. So they, they got to Winnipeg at 5 p.m. and there was a big parade to celebrate the arrival of the Royals that started at 7. So if you can imagine riding on a bus for 13 hours and then jumping off the bus and mar marching in a parade, but they did. There were a half a million people who saw the parade in Winnipeg. There were 19 bands in the parade and it was a judged event. Uh, and we know this because South Dakota State College Band took first place in the parade. Um, the next day, uh, Christie was awakened by his band members 
whooping and hollering and celebrating. And he asked them what, what the noise was all about. And the band members had found out before Christie did that they had won the parade. Christie's response was, and I quote, the hell we did. <laughs> he was pretty surprised that the band had won. For their efforts, they were awarded a $50 first prize. And here's what they did with the money. When they got home, they took that $50 and they gave it to a fundraising effort to build the Pugsley Union, which at that time was under construction. And so that $50 uh, bought a few bricks for the Pugsley Union. Um, the very next day, by the way, they, they, they slept overnight in an orphanage at St. Joseph's Orphanage. And we're gonna get back to that in a moment because that's a very cute story. But they woke up at seven o'clock on Wednesday the 25th to play for the actual arrival of the king and queen. They had to stand in the rain in, a, in one location and stood there for two hours and 45 minutes waiting for the royals to drive by. And finally, when they did, as you see in this picture, they played God Save the King as the royals drove by in the car. Christie is right here in the middle. He's standing kind of sideways. You see his cornet. He, again, he's playing with the band where my arrow is pointing there uh, as the king and queen drive by. They actually played for the Royals two more times that day. They played in a neighborhood, in an affluent neighborhood of Winnipeg where the king and queen were visiting. And then they played a concert at the orphanage at which they were staying and the king and queen were there to listen. And I love this next picture. There's some of the orphans holding the music for the band members as they played at the orphanage. It's just a marvelous picture. So the, uh, the band members from South Dakota State became rock stars in Winnipeg. Um, I don't think they bought a meal or a drink up there as can be uh, attested to by this, this little story in the Collegian when they got back. One band, uh, the band members became celebrities in Winnipeg after winning the parade competition. One band member was stopped in the street while in Winnipeg for Welcome Week, Royal Welcome Week, and was asked about the United States. After asking several questions, the young lady blushingly asked to be kissed because, quote, I have always wanted to be kissed by a Yankee, end quote. <laughs> State college courtesy, of course, was not lacking, even on one of the busiest avenues in Winnipeg. <laughs> so uh, they, they just became stars up there. So it was a quick trip. As I said, they, they, uh, they, they drove up on a Tuesday. And on Thursday, the 26th, they got back on the bus and drove home. Uh, they started a little late for home because, believe it or not, the assistant director overslept and they had to go up to his room and wake him up to get him on the bus. <laughs> uh, baton twirlers could first be seen in photographic evidence uh, in about 1938, but they wore the same uniform as the rest of the band. In 1940, uh, they were outfitted with these jaunty looking uniforms. And there's another picture here of the whole line. So speaking of uniforms, uh, again, the band has always been blessed with, with so much goodwill and good help from people. Uh, they've raised, Christy twice had to raise money for uniforms. Uh, $2,000 was raised in 1927, which was a very hefty sum of money at that time. Uh, ROTC gave profits from the military ball. The bookstore gave some money, the American Legion, profits from Little International, um, a local theater, you name it, they got a lot of money uh, from a lot of very generous people. In 1947, the War Department told college bands that they could no longer wear the, the ROTC uniforms for, for band uniforms. So now they had to go out and get a set of band uniforms. So the first real set of um, band specific uniforms, which was purchased in 1948, they had to raise $6,000 
uh, the Music Council, which is the Student Association, uh, an arm of the Student Association, gave $1,500 of that. Alumni, um, community, they had a name the goat contest. I love this story. So for some reason, there was a goat on campus that was used for Hobo Day celebrations, and they still had it. And they had a contest to name the goat. You gave some money and a suggestion for a name, and the money went to the uniforms and Unfortunately, what's been lost to time is who won the contest and what they named the goat. <laughs> I could never find that. But anyway, 111 uniforms were bought from J.C. Penney's in Brookings. And I have, I've, um, just in the last year, I found all the paperwork, like all the receipts and the orders. And it's, uh, we found them when we moved out of Lincoln Music Hall. And they bought 111 uniforms from J.C. Penney's in Brookings for $43.58 a piece. What was odd about it, though, when they bought these uniforms, but they only bought uniforms for the men. And the women were wearing a uniform, but it was very different and it didn't match. And so then in 1953, they decided to have another fundraising drive to... Um, get uniforms for the women. And one of the things they did was some of the men dressed up and went downtown to, uh, to make people aware that they were raising money for women's or for the uniforms for the women in the band. They also did another tag day. And I'm going to get out of this a moment. I'm going to show you something that we, again, we've just recently found in the last year. I told you about these tags. This is a tag from one of the tag days. And I don't know how much money people had to give. In the early 50s, I would imagine maybe 50 cents or a dollar, uh, something like that. And you would give some money and donate and you got back one of these tags that said, I contributed to raising money for girls, the girls band uniforms. So Christy, um, Christy, of course, is, is a legend. Uh, he was beloved. Every story I've heard, and I've met a few people who had played in Christy's bands. They just always speak uh, of him in the highest, in the highest way possible. Um, he was a mentor to his successors. I've had a chance to talk to some of the band directors who followed him, and they always spoke in just glowing terms about how supportive Christy was of them. Um, Christy, directed the band uh, until 1956, I believe I have the right date, passed away in, um, or excuse me, 19, uh, 1954. Um, he directed the band until 1954 and passed away in 1965. In 1957, he was honored by the band. As you can see here at State Field, they, drew, they wrote out Christie. And I think what's great about this picture is not only is this the South Dakota State College Band, but it's the USD Band as well. And they came up for the USD SDSU game and together they spelled out Christy. There's a picture of uh, Christy and Kenneth Carpenter. Kenneth Carpenter became the band director in 1957, and this was the day that he was honored at the game. And here is a photo of Christy being escorted to the podium at an outdoor concert. You can see this is at the base of the Campanile in the early 60s. He's being guided out by Dr. Warren Hatfield, who became the director of bands in 1961. Warren has told me a great story about Christy. By that time, Christy, as you can see, was um, getting up there in years. He's about 79 in this picture. And Warren always shared the story that he was very, very weak and, and he kind of have a hard time walking up to the podium. But then when he got to the podium, he just absolutely like lost 40 years in, in, in the way Warren would tell it. And he just uh, conduct and gesticulate. And it was just this marvelous conducting. And he was so energetic. And then when he'd walk off the podium, he was back to being 
you know, having a hard time moving around, but it was just something magical that happened when Christy got on the podium. After that, there were a few years of transition. Um, it's always tough to follow somebody who is such a legend. Roy Christofferson was the next person to take over. Roy had been at SDSU for several years. Um, so he took over as director of bands in 1954. Here you see Christy handing over uh, the, the world's largest baton uh, to Roy uh, to become director of bands. Roy was a, um, a band director who, had, who, who has his background at the University of Illinois, and he's credited with writing a lot of the early drill, the marching band drill, uh, because he had learned from Mark Hinesley, who was a professor at the University of Illinois and an innovator in marching, uh, marching drill writing. So, but he was only here for one year as the head guy and moved to Linden College in Vermont, where I think he took over the orchestra. And that's about as far as I was able to follow him. But the things you see in the late 40s and early 50s, um, as far as drill and visual things, um, apparently are the work of Christofferson. When Christofferson left, a gentleman by the name of Miles Markish came to SDSU in 1955. He had a very uh, wonderful pedigree, University of Wisconsin, Eastman. Uh, he had been in the military, went to the Army Band Leader School. He was a horn player. Uh, Markish was only at State College for uh, two years, 1955 and 1956. Uh, from here, he moved on to uh, Missouri, where he uh, taught for the remainder of his career. And actually, Mr. Markish lived uh, until just a couple years ago. I know he passed away just, just quite recently. In 1957, Ken Carpenter came to South Dakota State College. Um, he had received his bachelor's and master's degree from Drake. He would later on get his PhD at Iowa. That was after he left uh, State College, but he had been in the Air Force bands, gifted clarinet, saxophone player. And he was a very, from all accounts, of just a very enthusiastic, um, just a very go-getter type of personality. And uh, in addition to be a wonderful musician, he always said he wanted the marchingest outfit in the North Central Conference. The band grew under him. He was uh, obviously very popular. And Carpenter left his legacy here as well. He is the person who adopted or brought to us the song Ring the Bell. Uh, in the early, late 50s, early 60s, late 50s it would be, uh, he decided that we needed a more upbeat, up-tempo uh, school song. So he took the melody from the University of Chicago, a tune called Wave the Flag, and he replaced it with Ring the Bell, which, of course, there was the bell in um, North, I believe, either North or Central. North, I believe, was the building the bell was in. And he wrote these words. The last line, so let's ring, ring, ring those bells, there was a, uh, a carpenter opened up a contest to the students to see who could write the best last line. And a gentleman by the name of Stan Schleter wrote the last line. So let's ring, ring, ring those bells. And Stan went on to become um, a music educator himself. He taught at the University of Indiana for many, many years. Here's some of the drill that, that was uh, during Ken Carpenter's days, you can see they've got a little car here and they're holding these pieces of fabric or something that look like spokes in the wheel. This, this uh, set of pictures I find really fascinating. This is a horse and there's a blanket and it says USD. And on the opposite end of the field, is another picture, another horse, just like it. But as I understand, there was a blanket that said SDSU. And so he set these horses up on opposite ends of the field and they had a race. And it looked a little something like this, started like this. It went up the field. So they're
And I'm sure the SDSU horse won. And there's a lovely picture in Sylvan of the band. Carpenter left uh, in 1961 to take a job at Parsons College. Uh, Ken lived until uh, 2014, and I've spoken to his family on a couple occasions. Ken actually came back to campus in 2002. There was a centennial concert. Um, it was the centennial of the first formal concert, the concert band uh, centennial in 1902, and he came back and conducted a piece, and just a lovely gentleman. And speaking to his family, uh, he would he would say years later that he wished he wished he had he wished he had stayed at state. Before he left, though, he left us with these uniforms. He ordered these uniforms just before he left state college. 115 of these uniforms were purchased from the Oswald Company at $85 a uniform. Now this bunny overlay, this blue part, and then this gold lame part in the back was an overlay that could be removed. And then the jacket was just a regular suit jacket that could be worn for formal concerts, indoor concerts. And it was for many years. We still have, uh, thankfully, uh, we still have one or two of these uniforms and they're on display in our building. In 1961, uh, the university was absolutely blessed to welcome Warren Hatfield, who uh, we cannot give him enough credit for the growth of not only the marching band, but the music department at SDSU. Warren's a very important figure in our history. He came to us from um, University of Northern Iowa. He got master's and doctoral degrees from the University of Iowa. He was in the Air Force and played in the Strategic Air Command Band down in Omaha uh, during the mid 50s. And he also played in the Omaha Symphony. He was a, a director in, uh, in Iowa at some high schools in Iowa. And he was a student of uh, the legendary Jaime Voxman. If you ever played out of lesson books as a student, you probably played out of a, a Voxman method book. And there's that jacket I was telling you about. This is the jacket without the gold overlay that they used for concerts. Warren started a tradition that lasted over 20 years of the, of the pride going to Minnesota Vikings games once a year. Um, they would go up to the Twin Cities, usually in November, as Warren would say, they would play a game. Um, and on the way home, he said uh, they would stop in New Ulm. Uh, I don't know why New Ulm specifically, but apparently there was a place, uh, according to Warren, that they would stop and have a big dinner and maybe kind of an end of the year awards type of celebration. Uh, Warren was director of bands from 61 to 73, and he had the pride those years, as you can see, 61 through 64, again in 66 and 71 and 72. Warren served as department head from 1966 to 1993. He started the jazz program at SDSU. He is responsible for uh, the music department receiving accreditation uh, in the mid 70s, which was a very big deal for our music education students. Um, Warren in the early 70s um, was instrumental in saving the music education degree at SDSU. Um, there was a move to cut that program amongst a lot of other programs at the college at that time. And Warren made a, Warren made a lot of trips to Pierre um, and can, received, can, can be credited a great deal with saving the the music department from uh, losing its degrees. I mean, we still would have had bands, but they would have been, you know, mostly service organizations instead of degree uh, conferring uh, ensembles. And he is an inductee in the South Dakota Bandmasters Hall of Fame and alive and well in Phoenix, Arizona. So here's some pictures from Warren's early days. This is his first year, and we know that because this is still at State Field. Uh, this is the last year at State Field, 1962 Coughlin Alumni Stadium opened. And speaking of opening, here's a piano and let's open it 
Isn't that, isn't that great? The grand piano opens up. And got a couple other really neat pictures here. Here's a picture of a person kneeling down and playing a, playing a conga. You can see the, the head up here and the body and the legs. Some really nice, some really nice forms. And let's see, got another one here. Trumpet player. There's the bell of the trumpet and their arms and legs. So Warren writes some Warren wrote some great drill. Oops, I didn't mean to go ahead like that. Let's back up here. Warren wrote some great drill. And as you can see, it's very precise. It just looks great. Warren also incorporated the, the vocal ensembles into the marching bands here at SDSU. This is from 1962. This is from the, the first year of uh, the first year of Coughlin Alumni Stadium. And you see the Statesman and the Concert Choir and the Pasquettes, the, which we now know as Coralia, the women's choir. Um, singing and playing together on the field here in 1962. Uh, Warren didn't shy away from controversy with the band. This is a photo from 1972. Um, and of course, 1972 is the height of the Vietnam War era. And they made this peace sign and played Where Have All the Flowers Gone? Uh, and remember, at this time, they were traveling to the Minnesota Vikings games. And at that time, uh, speaking of the good old days, the halftime show was shown on national television. And so every year, the SDSU band was featured on national television. And they played this show in 1972. They played Where Have All the Flowers Gone and made a peace sign. And the president at that time of university, Hilton Briggs, received letters literally from all over the country, some of them praising the band and some of them asking the president to get rid of that commie band director. That's a direct quote from a letter. In 1965, Warren uh, took a year to finish his doctorate, and he served as the assistant director of bands at the same time at the University of Iowa. That's the year that the University of Iowa traveled to the Eastern Bloc countries into Russia, and so Warren was the assistant director of that trip, another um, really historically significant thing that Warren was part of. In his place, um, they hired John Colson, who was fresh from the University of Iowa, and was recommended to Warren to serve as the interim director of bands. John was only supposed to be here one year. Thank goodness, at the end of that one year, President Briggs came to John and said, John, how would you like to stay and build our orchestra? And this is quoting John. John's response was, well, I don't have anything better to do. So he stayed on. <laughs> <laughs> and did he ever. He stayed on uh, for over 30 years and directed the Pride for that one year in 65 and then again in 67 and 68. Of course, he's best known for his work with the Civic Symphony. He was an instructor of horn and trumpet and conducting. And uh, John was my trumpet instructor as a student and my conducting teacher uh, when I was a student at SDSU. And uh, I, I can't I can't think of anybody I admire more than, than John Colson. John invited some really heavy hitters to perform with the band. This is jazz trumpeter Bud Brisboy. Bud is, is known for his work with the Stan Kenton Orchestra, and he also did a lot of studio work in Hollywood. His trumpet playing can be heard on the theme music to the Mary Tyler Moore show, for those of you who remember Mary Tyler Moore. He was the trumpet. Uh, in that theme music, but he played with the band here, um, Hobo Day 1968. He also came back and played with the, uh, with the jazz band, with Warren's jazz band. 
and some fun, innovative pictures there. They played the Pink Panther. And that was uh, what Brisboy, this is from Brisboy's performance. Uh, they, they played the Pink Panther and formed a Pink Panther. You can see the little eyes up there. So the Pride of the Dakotas, how did we get that name? It was during Colson's time. Um, and according to Professor Colson, uh, during a 66 halftime show, the announcer, Craig McNamara, very organically as the band was marching off the field said, let's give a big thank you to the SDSU band, the Pride of the Dakotas. And the name, the name stuck. That's, that's how we we got our name that we have today, just kind of out of the blue. Um, and the name was even trademarked. Nobody else can use Pride of the Dakotas. It was trademarked in 2005. Um, as, as the university grew and as the music department grew, uh, so did the faculty. Gene Pollard came to SDSU in 1967 as assistant director of bands and as the percussion instructor. He was the first um, percussion specialist to teach at SDSU. Uh, before that, uh, I know Warren taught some percussion. I know John taught some percussion. Um, and of course, the band directors before uh, kind of taught everything. And now um, the faculty started to become more specialized. Uh, Gene came from uh, University of Colorado. Uh, he's, he's got his PhD from Columbia Pacific. He was not here very long. He was here for uh, about four years, but he was director of the Pride in the late 60s and went on to become director of bands at the University of Rhode Island. And as far as I know, he is still the band director at the University of Rhode Island 50 years after the fact. So when Gene Pollard left, um, Warren Hatfield took the band over, the pride over for another two years, uh, 71 and 72. And that was about the time where um, there became some, some struggles with the program um, as far as they, they, they were trying to cut the program. And Warren was finding that being department head and director of bands and trying to save all of it uh, and kind of being having to be a politician at the same time and an advocate for the university and for the department was becoming a bit too much. So they hired Dr. Darwin Walker and they hired him away from Northern State where he had been the, the director of bands. Uh, there, he got his bachelor's degree from Northern State and his master's and doctorate from Northern Colorado. He had been a very successful high school band director in South Dakota as well. So uh, Darwin came to SDSU in 73 and served as director of bands uh, for 10 years and taught until 1995 and a very distinguished career as a low brass instructor, um, <clears throat> a music ed direct, a music ed teacher. He taught the music ed curriculum and also taught music industry, our music entrepreneurship program. Um, fun story, when, when Darwin left Northern State, there were a few very loyal students who followed him to SDSU. And one of those students, we're gonna meet a little later, uh, Jim Cool, who ended up being director of the Pride um, was a freshman at Northern State, and when Darwin left, he left with Darwin to come to SDSU. So when, when Darwin came, there was uh, kind of some innovations in marching happening. Um, he kept with the picture shows, as you could see, but he also did something called patterns of motion, which for those of you who remember the term squads, it was groups of four people and the patterns of motion drill was based on movements of four people at a time. There were no um, you know, individual movements. It was all based on four people moving kind of in the same way at one time and all of those squads moving in different directions to, to produce different forms. He also um, was the first band director to use flags at SDSU and called them the blue line uh, flag Corps, and also introduced the dance team at that time called the Dakota Debs. Uh, he also led the band in the 1981 
inaugural parade. And a couple pictures of that. So there's, there's a picture of the blue line there in the back with the flags and in front with the different uniforms and the pom-poms and the, the, the Dakota Debs. There's a lovely picture of the color guard. And uh, this picture here is uh, based on that four four person squad. You see how everything everybody's lined up in groups of four, and a lot of forms were created out of those groups of four. And you see down front uh, they continued the tradition of having vocal groups. I think this is the statesman singing with them at this right down front there. but he still maintained pictures. Uh, you can see the steam shovel. You can see down here, the track. Um, they're all marching in a follow the leader. So it looks like the track is moving. And the story goes is that this bucket lowered down and picked up one of the twirlers. And you can see there's a, there's a twirler in the middle of the bucket there. And they did this all while playing 16 tons by Tennessee Ernie Ford. In 1981, the band was invited to march in the inaugural parade for, for Ronald Reagan. And uh, there's a good picture of that on the Capitol steps. On the left here is Jim Abner and uh, Larry Pressler, who were members of the South Dakota congressional delegation at that time. I'm sure a lot of you remember those names. To the right is Darwin Walker, uh, right here, where my arrow's moving. And, uh, to his right, or to, to my right, his left, uh, was a guy by the name of Roger Fallman, who uh, was the percussion instructor at that time and would later take on the pride. I'm going to point out one little, it might be hard to see, but right next to Darwin's the drum major there. The name of that drum major is Fred Elwine. And the reason it's such a great story is Fred Elwine would go on to become the director of the Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps, which is a musical unit of the United States Army based in Washington, DC. It's one of the finest musical groups in the military. And Fred went on to become the commander of that. And Fred's last tour of duty was the inaugural, the first, I believe the first inauguration of Barack Obama in 2009. And he led the old guard in that inaugural parade as well. Uh, Roger Fallman had a, a short stint here at SDSU. He came in 1980 and was the director of the Pride for a couple of years and also, uh, as I said, was the instructor of percussion. And that's a picture of Roger. Roger's still alive and well. Last I heard, he's living in Thailand. And there is a picture of one of his bands in, uh, in 1981. Uh, when the band celebrated their, when the, not the band, the university celebrated its centennial. So this is from 19, the fall of 1981. Jim McKinney came to SDSU in 1975 to serve as the director of the Pride and percussion instructor. Uh, he had recently finished his master's at the University of Arkansas and was director of Friends University in Wichita. Um, he got to know folks at SDSU. He had, he had gotten a job at a summer music camp out in the Black Hills, and he met the faculty at SDSU, and that's how he found out that there was a, a job opening in, in 1975. Uh, fresh from Arkansas and a native of Georgia, Jim McKinney uh, came to South Dakota State University. Jim spent uh, a few years at SDSU, and then um, moved to Iowa State for a few years, where he was the director of the marching band there, head of jazz studies and percussion instructor from 1978 to 1983. Um, Jim enjoyed his time at Iowa State, but just had uh, a, a ton of duties on his plate, and he didn't feel as though help was coming anytime soon, and was becoming just a little bit 
disenfranchised, I think, maybe with some of the things happening there. And about that time, Roger Fallman left and he came back to be the percussion instructor and director of bands where Jim stayed until 2009. And some of, uh, some of the most historic member moments in the pride happened with Jim as director. He taught percussion for 20 years, was director of bands for um, almost 30 years total between his stint in the 70s and then here in the 80s. And uh, his professor, uh, director emeritus. An amazing list of accomplishments that happened during Jim's time. Uh, they played, continued to play the Vikings games. They played at another inaugural for President Bill Clinton in 1997. Um, they performed at Bill Clinton's final campaign stop, which happened to be in Sioux Falls, South Dakota in November of 1996. Uh, they played at a Green Bay Packers game in 1998, the National Independence Day Parade in Washington, D.C. in 2000. Um, they also performed at the PBS Capital Fourth Public Broadcasting. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Two Rose Bowl parades um, led the campaign to purchase a matching set of instruments, which we still enjoy today. I'm going to talk a little more about that as well. In 1998, when when news broke that they were going to play at the Packers game. Uh, the band, which at that point was 250, absolutely exploded uh, as far as enrollment. It went over 300. And for the next decade, the band was between 300 to almost 400 members during that just glorious time. He also developed the very famous drum line and the brass line started under his leadership as well. That's just a little look at the, I dropped that in there kind of as an evolution of the uniform too, just as an aside over the, the last 50 years or so. And I'll show you the, the one we're currently in here in a moment. As I said, we played for Bill Clinton's last campaign stop in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And I was with the band that night. I was drum major at that time. And we played and played and played and played and played. And at the end of the night, we were told to stay in our seats. Uh, so we stayed. And then we were told that we were to go to the floor of the arena. At that time, it was at the Sioux Falls Arena. We were told to go to the floor because the president wanted to meet the band. And so there he is with Jim McKinney handing him a pride of the Dakotas hat uh, and Bill happily wearing it. And he went around and shook hands with uh, pretty much the entire band that night. It was really, really something else. And we started chanting inaugural parade <laughs> to which Bill said, well, it sounds good to me. And a few months later, we were marching down Pennsylvania Avenue. The band played a, a lovely arrangement of um, we shall overcome because not only was it uh, the inauguration day, it was, it coincided with the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. And so Jim Cool, whose name I mentioned before, uh, did an arrangement of We Shall Overcome, and that's what we marched down the street to. As I said, in 2000, the band was invited to perform at the National Independence Day Parade in Washington, D.C. And at the same time, um, the organizers of the public broadcasting show, A Capital Fourth, which is the big variety show held every year on the Capitol grounds, um, invited us to perform there as well. And so we performed for an international television audience on uh, the night of July 4th, and it featured actor Barry Bostwick, seen there uh, wearing a pride shirt that we gave to him. Um, so just a few more pictures from 
just some really marvelous years of growth and uh, amazing activity in, in the band those years. Uh, this is from 1998, when again, the band crossed the, the 300 mark. This was uh, the day that the Campanile reconstruction of the Campanile remodel uh, was dedicated. So the Campanile had gone under a major restoration. They did a, uh, a ceremony uh, rededicating it. And that was our celebration of, of that day. And as you can see, the band just got enormous. I mentioned too, and I've mentioned several times that the band has been the beneficiary, beneficiary of some just marvelous people uh, along the way during our history. And, and again, in, in the early 2000s, I believe 2005, 2006, there was a capital campaign that was undertaken to buy instruments for the entire band. Um, at that time, saxophone players, trumpet players, trombone players, clarinet flute players had to supply their own instruments. So there was a capital campaign undertaken with the help of uh, First Bank and Trust. And for every dollar that was donated, First Bank and Trust gave $2. And if I'm not mistaken, a little over, I'm going to come back to these pictures in a moment. And a little over $300,000 was raised. And to this day, every member of the Pride that joins, the, everybody who joins the band is supplied with an instrument because of that marvelous campaign that took place um, about 15 years ago now. So that, I'll show you this picture here. In 2003, the band was invited to their first Tournament of Roses parade, one of the very few college bands in the country to march in that parade and not have their football team there with them. So a beautiful rose uh, formation there to celebrate that invitation. And the band would go again in January of 2008. When Jim retired after just a legendary career, Eric Peterson was named director of bands. He came to us from uh, the University of Utah where he was the assistant director of bands. Eric was here for five years. He directed the Pride for one year uh, and his duties as director of, of bands and his duties in the low brass area, he taught euphonium and tuba. Uh, just became a bit much. Uh, the workload became a bit much. So at that was when our friend Jim Cool became director of the band. But Jim was no stranger to the band. Jim had been an assistant director since the 70s when he was a, when he was a master's student. And pretty much everything that you heard that band play for about 30 years from the late 70s, uh, almost 40 years, from the late 70s, early 80s, up until um, up until his retirement in 2015, Jim Cool arranged. The sound of that band uh, was Jim Cool's pen. Jim was a student at SDSU. He got his bachelor's and master's. And as I said, spent a career uh, teaching theory, music theory, teaching guitar, and was the assistant director for years and years, as well as the pep band director and oversaw the color guard for many years as well. Jim is an absolutely gifted arranger and we still play a lot of his tunes because they're just that good, you can't get rid of them. In 2011, new uniforms were purchased and that went right along with uh, another national trip to the Fresh from Florida Parade, also known as the Citrus Parade, Citrus Bowl Parade. Um, and this uniform kind of paid honor to the past while at the same time looking to the future. As you can see, the name, the pride. Down here, this stripe with SDSU, which was kind of a recall of the uniform from the 70s. And then of course, the introduction of one of the new 
SDSU logos that came about in uh, 20, uh, 2009, 2010, and was added to the uniform when the new uniforms came out in 2011. In 2015, we celebrated the 125th anniversary of the band and the 50th year of it being known as the Pride. In, whoops, in 2015, one of the streets on campus was named Pride of the Dakotas Avenue. And I challenge you to find another college marching band in the country that has a street named after them. We're now, the football team is, is now housed in the beautiful Dana J. Dykehouse Stadium. And we have a cutout seat section that is especially for the band. It has extra wide rows and it has direct access to the field. None of the other stands do. So we can get in and out very quickly uh, for halftime shows. It's a great place to play. But we know that the more things change, the more things stay the same. So I went a little bit longer than I had planned, but it's, it's so fun to tell the story. And uh, I, I wouldn't blame you a bit if you called it a night, but if anybody has any questions, um, I would be happy to hang out and answer them. And you can either turn on your mic or you can type them into chat. Thanks, Kevin. Great presentation. Thank you so much. I got a couple comments. Uh, when you talk about Christy, uh, Janice and I were privileged to be the one to go get him under the Hatfield era in the 64, 63, 4-5 time frame. We'd bring him up to the band room uh, so that he could practice with the band because he would then direct the band. So we were his official chauffeurs in those latter years. And uh, he uh, also directed the band. You mentioned his flailing hands. The story on that is pretty real because Janice was the bass drum player. And he always demanded that she be the bass drum player for him. And he directed the bass drum with his left hand and the rest of the band with his right hand. Ah. That was his story. And he wanted her because she followed his left hand. And, and so that was our Christie story. And uh, we'd help him into the car. It didn't make any difference how much snow there was or what it was. We'd go get him and take him to practices. Those That's were some of our little Christie stories. I would ask you a question on him. Didn't Sousa write the South Dakota State University marching thing in honor of Christie? Um, Carl King. Oh, yeah, March King, yeah. sure. Yeah, Carl King wrote the South Dakota State College March. And I, what I think is the, is the story is that King and Christie met one another because they were inducted into the American Bandmasters Association at about the same time. Yeah, and of I, course, I, you know, King made trips all over the place. King, King brought, you know, King brought the band, uh, I, I believe King brought the band to South Dakota at one time as well. So they, they knew one another. We have another story that we'd tell you, but it would take a lot longer than these folks would probably want to hear about a war in Hatfield and our visit to a Vikings game. That was, uh, we got up there and had no hotel. 
oh. with the band. <laughs> if you can imagine showing up with our, what, almost 200 people, and then we had no hotel because the hotel that we had reservations for had sold itself and nobody remembered that we had reservations. So they scrounged and made rooms and uh, made a reservation at, I think it was called the Dykeman in that day, those days, which was kind of the red light district of uh, North Minneapolis. <laughs> <laughs> and we got about half the rooms in the Dykeman and half in uh, uh, our hotel. And Janice and I had just been gotten married. So it was 1965, I guess, probably 60, maybe 64, 64. the fall of 64 Vikings game. And so Warren and Gretchen were the chaperones and we were the other chaperones. So he looked at me and he says, Al, I don't know whether to send you with the girls over to the Dykeman or, or I don't know whether to send the girls to the Dykeman or the boys to the Dykeman or give, send the girls over and teach them new tricks or give the boys an opportunity. So <laughs> that was our chaperoning, chaperoning day. <laughs> so Gretchen and he took the girls and went to the Dykeman. <laughs> that's great. I've never heard that story. Thank you for sharing that because I have never heard that. That's terrific. <laughs> well, and the other thing I would ask you, you mentioned the pride, but I'll tell you, we weren't there when that, when you made the date for the pride, I thought that came from Warren himself earlier than that. I remember the pride before I left. First or second year. Yeah. Really? Okay. okay. I think Warren actually named it, and that maybe the announcer got it from that, and that's what made it popular. That could very, that could very well be, yeah. Um, you know, and I, you were there, so I, I, uh, I, I, I know you're you're right. Um, the the story, the where I got that story from was that's how John told it, and um, you know I don't, you know I spent when I was researching this, I flew to Phoenix and spent a, a day with Warren. I, I, it could have been a week. I wish it would have been. Um, and we, we talked about a few of those, a few of those kind of origin stories. It, it wouldn't shock me a bit if that was Warren who, who coined that. Yeah. I, I remember, and I think Janice does too. I remember using the term, the pride and, and we left when I went to work in 65. So, hmm. okay. Uh, so, at any rate, that's my contribution, and I really enjoyed your presentation. It was fantastic. Well, I, I'm so glad you you jumped in, and I, I really love that story about the the trip to Minneapolis. I'm sure that things like that age a band director a few years. I can't imagine <laughs> Warren having a deal. You know, I I since I've been here, I had. Um, I had a hotel cancel their rooms on us, but it was before we left town. Oh, it was only about, it, it was about 48 hours before we got there, but they called me and they said, we don't have any rooms for you. <laughs> but it all got straightened out before the buses rolled. I can't imagine getting up to Minneapolis and not, and not having any rooms right in the moment. That's- <laughs> Well, I can tell you, we really filled that lobby. Standing and waiting for them to tell us what to do. <laughs> that's just that's that's just insane. <laughs> well, thank you for the presentation. My pleasure. I really appreciate everybody dropping by. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And I just want to congratulate you on this past year. I know it's been kind of crazy with the marching band, but you guys did a fantastic job of kind of pushing through what this fall was. And I know I am looking forward to maybe a more traditional fall marching band season next fall. Uh, yeah, we all are. Uh, yeah. and, and for those of you who are joining us, a Ashley is, is too humbled to, to say this, but Ashley works with the pride uh, for the last, what is it? 
13 years now, Ashley? 13 years, yeah. I can't believe I, we've been here this long. So Ashley has been the director of our of our frontline mallet percussion. Of course, her husband, Aaron, is director of percussion studies at SDSU. And and I would be absolutely and completely lost without Ashley and Aaron and Jake Wallace, who's our director of concert bands, and Andrea Kikafer, who is the director of the of the uh, color guard. And of course, Kathy Larson, who is who is our band mom. If you know Kathy, she's she's looked over the the uniform inventory and has uh, um, carried carried the first aid kit and and been and been the the mom away from home for this band for about twenty five years. Uh, it's it, it's a it's a great team, and we have uh, terrific days ahead of us. Uh, keep an eye out on the news. Uh, that comes out from the university because in, in hopefully very short order, we're going to be able to discuss um, another substantial national trip that this band is so well known for. And I hope in the next couple months that we can share that, that news with you. We're, we're putting the final touches on it. So I, 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 I can't divulge tonight because uh, I, I would not want to, uh, get ahead of, of myself or some other some other people to university or, or it just jinx it. <laughs> uh, but just keep an eye out in the next couple months because there's some exciting news coming. So thanks again, everybody for stopping by. We, we shouldn't tell our grandson <laughs> who's in the pride. Who's your grandson? Nick Peterson. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> We, we've, <laughs> we've been covered the pride from 65 to 2001, or 61, wow. from 61 to 2021. Yeah. You, you have, you have some, some great insight and, and uh, some terrific stories. And that, that story about Christie is just, just wonderful. I, I love talk. I've, I've had the pleasure of, of meeting some people who, who played for Christie, you know, and, uh, he was there until the mid fifties. So there's, there's still a lot of people who are around who, who played for him and, and uh, just, just terrific stories. I, I, I love hearing every single one of them. So thanks so much. I, I would also your, encourage your presentation. Oh, yeah. This year that uh, if you head over to SDSU's um, both their website, as well as the Facebook page, that all the concerts this season are live streamed, which is pretty amazing that even all the way in Arizona, you can pick up any concert that the university is having this year. So it's been, I know that we've been enjoying that at our house, but I will also be glad to be able to get back into the amazing hall there and be able to see live music too. Uh, this is the first in our series of Tune In Tuesdays. Next week, we do have um, Steve Randall and Jim Pollock, who were uh, photographers for the Army in Vietnam but they are also now playing air artists. So they'll be joining us next week. Then we are hosting the South Dakota Poet Laureate, Christine Stewart, the week after. And then we have a presentation on the history and music of Johnny Cash. So we have some a couple of great weeks here, all online that you can do from home, uh, even in your pajamas if you want. You just don't even have to turn on your screen. And uh, thank you, Kevin, for joining us today. I really appreciate you coming and sharing the history of the Pride. I know that... Uh, it was, it's a great presentation. And I hope that uh, hopefully the university will be able to, maybe we can put that up on your social media pages up there so people can enjoy it as well. So, but thank you all for joining us today and uh, stay warm and um, maybe we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.